How do young people inform themselves these days? It's Media Goes to School Week here in France, France 24, partnering with workshops and a special edition of Truth or Fake, the news magazine that exposes disinformation in the digital age. With us, Derek Thompson of the France 24 Observers, our investigative website that works with eyewitnesses and citizen journalists. How are you, Derek? Good. All right. Good to see you. In this special edition of the France 24 debate, Derek is going to be serving up uh, some neat tools you can use to fact check stuff that you see on social media, uh, powerful media. After all, you get those short and punchy clips, images, memes and statements that play on our emotional heartstrings from Instagram to Snapchat, from Twitch to TikTok. Are young people any better than us uh, chronologically challenged folks? at sorting fact from phony. TikTok's emerged as the medium of choice in this pandemic with its addictive, wacky and whimsy stream of short musical clips. You wouldn't think the Chinese owned platform would be a news source or a fake news source. And yet, after a year that's seen conspiracy theories uh, fuel a run on the US Capitol, uh, Derek will be saying otherwise. Today in the France 24 debate, how to deal with this information. We're also pleased to welcome uh, Maya Lundi, student at the uh, Lycée International, the international high school in uh, the Paris suburb of Saint-Germain-en-Laye. Thank Thanks you for being for with us. Me. Well, welcome, welcome. Welcome, as, welcome back to Gabriel uh, uh, Latanzio, English teacher at uh, Paul Robert uh, High School that's in the uh, eastern Paris suburb of Lilia, northeastern Paris suburb. It is, yes. Happy to be here. Welcome, welcome. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Uh, Derek, um, <clears throat> how do you know when you've stumbled upon something fishy? Oh, that's that. Uh, well, that required a whole, a whole show. <laughs> to tell you about it. Um, so we've uh, done a 10 minute show for this year and let's take a look at the first half. Welcome to the 2021 edition of Truth or Fake. Social networks keep us informed and allow us to organize. Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, these different platforms are a way for people to reveal what's happening. But how to tell what's true and what's fake? What if it's propaganda or the images have been manipulated? <laughs> For this year's programme, we spoke to four French high schools, asking students to give us their questions about misinformation online and how to spot it. À quel moment doit-on se poser la question de savoir si l'information est vraie ou pas? Quels sont les indices que l'on peut repérer pour ne pas risquer de partager un tox? Whenever you come across something online, ask yourself some questions. Who published the information and why did they publish it? Where and when did the incident happen? And did it even happen at all? There are a few warning signs that can suggest something might be fake. For example, the tone used in the caption. Now take a look at these examples. Look really, really closely. Politicians are terrible at staging events. You can see it's a folding needle. The video shows US Vice President Kamala Harris getting vaccinated against the COVID-19 virus. It was being sent around with suggestions that she didn't really get vaccinated, that the event was staged. The video has been manipulated. It's been slowed down, for instance. Some people saying there's no needle, others wondering why it seems to fold. The image quality is bad. It's hard to make out the details. But it's easy to find other versions of the video online. Pick some keywords and do a search. The event was covered by US news sites. You'll find the same video, but in better resolution. And if you look closely, you can see there is indeed a needle. Here's another tip. Look in the comments. There's often useful information in there. In this case, people explaining that the plastic tip that folds back on itself is in fact a security measure designed to avoid accidental injury. Another quick search, and you see such needles are widely available. Take a look at this headline. It's supposedly from the Spanish newspaper El Mundo. Araceli, the first woman vaccinated in Spain, died 24 hours after getting the vaccine. 
The first thing to do is go check the El Mundo website. There's no trace of the article. And that's not surprising, because the screenshot is actually fake. It's been photoshopped. Here's the real article. RSLE, 96 years old, becomes the first woman vaccinated in Spain. And there was a clue. The font used in the fake headline is different from the one that El Mundo uses. This woman didn't die 24 hours after receiving the vaccine in December 2020. She actually even popped up again in Spanish media a month later, when she got her second dose of the vaccine. So be careful when you see screenshots of articles or documents. They could be fake, so always try to find the original. Quel comportement doit-on avoir Comment réagir face à une publication qui a été partagée par plusieurs internautes Est-il également toujours possible de retrouver la source de l'information When we receive something online, we don't always know where it comes from. We should ask ourselves who posted it and why. Can we use a search engine to check the information? Ask questions. Now take a look at this video that was circulating on WhatsApp in Jordan. In the Marseille metro, French police against a group of Moroccans and Algerians. We also found it going around in Mexico with a different caption. In the Paris metro, police used truncheons against people not wearing masks. So what was actually going on? Let's take another listen. Now it's hard to hear, but it is clearly not French. Now take a look as well. Use your eyes. Does that look like a French metro station? And how about those uniforms? Are they like ones worn by the French police? You can find all that information online. To find out where a video first appeared online, you can do what's called a reverse image search. Start out by making a screenshot of the video. Then download an app for reverse image searching. Put the screenshot into the app and it will show you where else the image has appeared online. If you're on a computer, you can download a plugin called Invid. You upload the video and Invid breaks it up into different frames and searches for them online. Both of these techniques take you to where the video was published online, on news sites in Romania. You cut and paste the headline into a translation tool, and here's what you get. Police operation in Bucharest. Hooligans arrested in metro station. So it turns out it wasn't in Paris or in Marseille. You can use these techniques to find out whether the backstory behind a photo or video is true or not. Your phone is a toolbox. You can use it to access search engines, reverse image search, translation tools, and even geolocation tools. And Maya Lindsay, have, have you ever done, did you know about reverse imaging? Uh, I have heard of it, yes, but I've never used it myself. Okay. And how much of your news do you get from social media? Uh, I would say I get most of my news from social media, particularly Instagram. There are many posts on there that will either posted by actual news sources or by other people. Um, and I try to look at the ones that have sources to them. But I, I also look at news on uh, other apps. Right. And has your, how's your Instagram feed fared over the past year? Because we saw a lot of the examples given uh, there uh, are conspiracy theories linked to uh, COVID and to the vaccination campaign. Have you seen some of these pop up? Uh, I haven't seen for myself any kind of... Uh, you know, lies spread about vaccines and COVID. I think that it sort of depends of, of the demographic uh, and, and, you know, it changes whether or not you're interested in that sort of content. Uh, Gabriel Latanzio, uh, your students, are they like Maya? Do most of them get their news from social media now? Oh, certainly. Um, actually, that's what informs my work the most is kids show up to my class and say, oh, have you heard what happened at the Capitol in January? That's that's what we talked about. Or they want to have my take on why Trump lost while he won in 2016. They do follow the news. And I'm quite pleasantly surprised. Now, I think the conversation we're having is about how do we make sure that young people do not spend too much time with fake news. But I think the question also should be, how do we make it so that they are attracted to reliable news? We, I, th I, I do think this is this is really the issue because uh, we can give the tools and what you showed just now was very practical and very useful and I, I can only imagine that many of my colleagues will show it in class for sure. I, I might. But I'm also concerned about who do they trust? Who do they trust? And I think what social media really did 
is encourage people to go towards people they actually know. So they will trust their friends much more so than they will trust TV channels. And that's, that's, that's my concern with the students I have. Yeah, you agree with that? Yeah, I definitely agree that uh, it is easier to trust sources that, um, that you've seen before or that come from your friends. Rather than uh, w ones you don't. So what do they think of those news sources? Are they, do, do a lot of your friends have, follow the news on news, n news accounts on, on Instagram and such? Um, I'm not sure if they follow news accounts, but I do know that most of the people around me uh, do use social media as a way to look at the news and learn about what's going on in the world. And there seems to be this, this, this gap, right, Gabrielle, between, uh, look, you know, uh, right. where well, we are here, which is mm. a traditional news channel, uh, or what you might even call the mainstream media, right. and social media. How much of a gap is there, really? Huge. Immense. I, I think my students, if they ever learn anything about what's happening in Anglophone countries, it might be because I told them about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and they will tune into her Instagram. And, and I think the conversation we might, be, we, we might have is, why do people gravitate towards people rather than organizations, if that makes any sense? Uh, you, journalists are perceived as being spokespersons for institutions. And it's harder to trust an institution than it is sometimes to trust a person that is reliable where people recognize themselves. I think, I think that's really, really key. And that explains a little bit why AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, was so popular or is so popular even among my students. It's because she makes it personable. And, and yeah. Yeah, so... Uh not, not too many of your friends, you can break it to me straight here, <laughs> not too many of your friends watch France 24 for news then. I'm not sure about that, <laughs> but... They'll but be I tuning in tonight, though, oh. following his logic, because they, they, they trust you. <laughs> yes, that, that is true. Uh, but I do agree with what you mentioned about uh, Ale Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, she is a very personable person, and you are, you are more inclined to trust her because she does have a way of interacting with younger people uh, that makes her you know, more trustworthy especially because she is a prominent politician. Right. From our, from, so it's interesting. This, we're talking about this schism between uh, the, uh, the regular media, quote-unquote, and, and social media. From the observer's team, Maïva Poulet went to the Lycée Hector Berlioz, a high school in the eastern suburb of Vincennes, and uh, the exchange was robust. This, ha this was this morning, huh, by the way. Um, here's a question for us asked by high school senior Marine. Comment vous faites pour répondre à la rapidité à la demande d'info euh, bah, express euh, Parfois, enfin, ça met plusieurs jours à vérifier pour une photo. Vous faites comment pour choisir Je sais pas moi pour euh, illustrer un article, prendre une photo si ça met plusieurs jours à vérifier alors qu'il faut publier l'article dans la dans les heures qui suivent. So Derek, I'm going to put it to you that question. It's a great question because here we are uh, wondering if it all doesn't go too fast on social media, but she's asking the same thing about us. It's, it's a very tricky question. Um, we have to generally, whenever we're, we're debunking fake news, we have to weigh the, uh, how much something has already been distribu distributed against, um, against how quickly we have to debunk it. If something has just been shared by a few hundred people, then it's not worth debunking it until we're absolutely sure. But if something's been shared already by millions of people, then we have to be absolutely sure when we debunk it. But sometimes we're not sure. So it's a very tricky thing. Sometimes if we just have doubt, all we can say is, hold on, we have doubt about this item. So it's better not to share it. We're trying to learn more. We try to be as transparent as possible. But it's hard to give hard and fast rules. So it can be, it can be very tricky. It varies from case to case. Varies from case to case. It's particularly hard in the newsroom, Derek, uh, when you're dealing with things uh, such as... Uh, criminal cases where charges are quick to fly. No, ab absolutely. In, in the newsroom, we have tradi you know, traditional sources for, for most of that information. So that, that kind of thing is, it can be quite reliable. Um, but it's when there, there are fake things, it's very hard to react as quickly as the fake things. Um, there have been studies done by M MIT that, that fake information travels seven times as fast as true information on Twitter. So as soon as it's out there, we're trying to play catch up. 
And the problem is we're never going to catch up all the pieces of fake news that are out there on all the different platforms. And so we try to combine every time we debunk one piece of, of, of misinformation or disinformation, we try to combine it with a lesson that will give people the reflex at least to know that a future piece of, of information could be fake as well. Has the street credibility of, uh, uh, of, of media as a whole, be it social media or more traditional outlets like TV, radio, new print, how are we doing? Because five years ago when the U.S. election happened and we saw that there was so much disinformation on Facebook and it may have swayed uh, the election, have we gotten better? Probably. I would like to say that I'm quite optimistic if we're thinking long term and quite pessimistic if we're thinking short term. When you mentioned the election of 2016 in the United States, all I can think of is the best take I ever heard about that election was Trump won because some voters prefer to elect someone who was a bad person, but who they related to. They recognized themselves in him rather than vote for someone they did not understand and they could not relate to. And I think people gravitate towards people that they relate to more so. Now, Social media, um, I, I, I've stressed that point already about being personable, um, but I would say telling the truth takes a long, long time. That's, that's something that I feel I have a, I, I've, I've been thinking about with my students. Lying is immediate. It works short term. Lying is a sprint and telling the truth is a marathon. It takes time for the truth to eventually win over. And the reason why I'm optimistic is that social media really is new, it's 10 years old. I mean, I can only imagine that after we invented books, 10 years after it was invented, or some years after it was invented, people were, were thinking, okay, what is a good, reliable book? It took, so long, it took a long, long time for people to, to build that ability to recognize what is you know, reliable and what is not. And I think we're just in the infant stage of, of our understanding of social media, so we'll be fine. Yeah, you look back at, 18th century newspapers, they were full of libel and... I imagine, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And the sort of thing. Uh, Maya Lundi, though, it's Instagram, uh, Twitter, they're not really spaces for nuance, are they? Um, no, it's true that it is very easy to find like hard truths on there. Uh, and yeah, there, there is not much space for nuance because lots of people like to tell it directly and they, have, they like to keep uh, straight opinions and not really navigate from that. Um, that's how I think a lot of disinformation gets spread because people aren't willing to listen to the arguments of others and rather would stick to their own opinions. And is your account public or private for Instagram? For uh, my account is private. Because it, that, that's the other thing. Are you speaking to just your friends or to the whole planet? Uh, well, I don't really use Instagram to post that much. But if I did, I would only really want my friends to see it because... I'm not really interested in sharing, you know, private photos with everyone in the world. Not that I think that everyone would have. Have young people gotten better at that in terms of figuring out that there could be consequences if they share too much? Yeah, I think definitely in the time that social media has existed, uh, you know, the awareness of posting publicly has definitely been more and more important. And I think people are more and more aware of that. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you share that, uh, Derek? Because you've been working on this for years now. Do you share that sense that there is growing awareness? Oh, absolutely. No, in, in France, um, media education is part of the national curriculum. So kids are taught this in schools. So they have a, a reflex now. They, they've all heard of um, a reverse image search that we just saw in the segment we watched. Um, and uh, and the, the student, teachers who are doing work like uh, like Gabrielle about on media education have definitely rammed that home. But kids are smart too. They know what's going on. They know there are bad people, bad actors out there trying to fool them. And they're very savvy on on what's true and what's fake, but they can be as naive as, as the rest of us. Um, mm -hmm. I've been very interested going into schools to see how smart kids are on, um, we've asked them a lot about the COVID vaccine. It's not something kids talk about much um, naturally amongst themselves anyway. But when we showed them some examples of, um, of false information about the vaccines, they said, oh yeah, that's obviously fake. Um, but then we, there was a question that came up several times when we were preparing this show, um, several different schools, they asked us if Joe Biden is in fact a pedophile. And that blew my mind because this is kids here in France who are hearing this, this um, what's the polite word, this, this entirely unfounded rumor, the QAnon conspiracy theory. Right. They've heard it here in France and 
They know it's probably not true. They know it's probably not true. We're going to pick up on that, Derek, because we have to take a Derek. We have to take a quick break. But when we come back, we're going to see a segment uh, about the U.S. elections. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. It's uh, media goes to school week here in France. And uh, we've been exchanging with high school students uh, about uh, fake news, as it's called, disinformation, uh, how to fact check what's out there. Uh, We're talking about it with uh, Derek Thompson, editor in chief of The Observers, the France 24 uh, investigative news website. We're also in the company of Maya Lundi, who's a student at the Lycée International, a senior? Yes. A senior at the Lycée International, the high school uh, west of the French capital. Gabriel Latanzio, English teacher at uh, Paul Robert High School in the uh, northeastern Paris suburb of uh, Les Lila. The Pew Research Center does an annual survey, and every year it finds the number of people, young people, who get their news from social media increases in the United States. It's the same story here and everywhere, as Derek and the team from The Observers found that can also be laden with pitfalls. Dans notre classe, il y a eu de nombreuses questions autour des élections américaines et de Joe Biden, le nouveau président. Comment vous, les journalistes, avez-vous travaillé sur le sujet et quelles sont les fausses informations que vous avez vues circuler The 2020 election came after four years of President Donald Trump in the White House. He used the term fake news for coverage he didn't like, but he was also, of course, known for spreading it himself. Fact-checking journalists at the Washington Post tracked every tweet, speech and interview Trump did, and counted more than 30,000 false or misleading statements over his four years in office. The president's baseless claims about election fraud even led to the invasion of the US Capitol by his supporters. Now, the fake news didn't stop with Joe Biden's election. A few days before he took office, Trump's eldest son, Donald Jr., tweeted this video that showed then-Senator Biden looking lost and disoriented. Trump Jr. was echoing his father's line that at 78, Biden is too old for the White House. They support sleepy Joe Biden. But the Biden clip is misleading. You can find the original on his YouTube channel. You can see that the video has been cropped. In the original, it's clear that Biden is waiting for two other people to leave the stage. The world of politics is, of course, biased. It's no surprise that a candidate's son might undermine his father's opponent. But journalists have to be objective. The Washington Post is continuing to fact check Joe Biden's statements from the White House, just as they did for Donald Trump. Comment vérifier les centaines d'informations que vous recevez par jour? Combien de temps ça vous prend de vérifier toutes ces informations? It's a good question. If you get lucky, it can take just a few minutes to show that something is fake, but it can also take hours or even days. And with the huge volume of information that's being shared, there's no way we can check everything. Fortunately, though, there are fact-checking journalists around the world, and we work together, sharing information and getting it out as widely as possible. We've been cooperating on the COVID-19 virus, for instance, publishing more than 9,000 articles in 70 different countries and making them available to the public in a searchable database. The hope is that members of the public will do what we do, take the time to check a piece of information before they share it. Sometimes it's tempting, of course, to hit share without thinking, especially if it's something we feel strongly about or a cause we want to defend. That can be a problem too, and actually end up hurting the cause we're trying to support. Here's an example about the Uyghur people of China. The Uyghurs are a Muslim minority who face persecution in China, imprisonment, re-education programs, secret mass internment camps. All of this has been widely documented by witnesses, news reports and NGOs. There's lots of support for the Uyghur cause online. There are thousands of tweets with the hashtag Uyghur Lives Matter. And one photo keeps coming up again and again. 
A reverse image search shows that it in fact comes from Chicago in 2004. It was a reenactment by a group that has nothing to do with the Uyghurs. The woman being tortured is an actress. Some people say that doesn't matter. It's important to draw attention to the very real suffering of the Uyghur people. But Uyghur activists say that's wrong. Speaking the truth is very important for us. And if someone sees those pictures and find out if those pictures are fake, they will have doubt about the whole camps, the team of millions of Uyghurs. Some people share posts knowing that they're not true, but they do it because it will help their cause. Other people accidentally share fake content because they didn't check it first. So take time to think before you share something, so that you don't end up making yourself or a cause that you support look bad. You can find reliable information, of course, on all the social networks. But always be vigilant. Watch out for warning signs like bad quality video, screenshots of articles, and captions saying they're hiding the truth. Read the comments for clues and use the tools on your phone to check facts. A big thank you to the French Education Ministry's media education arm, which is helping teachers use truth or fake as a teaching aid in schools. And thank you to the four classes who participated for their tough questions on our work as fact checkers and journalists. Gabriela Tanzio, the fact that the uh, accent is being put at uh, the government level on stopping the spread of uh, disinformation, can that be interpreted the wrong way? You mean people would distrust, um, distrust authority figures like teachers or the state? Yeah, or just, or just whether the government doesn't want you to say bad things about it. Hmm. That is a good question. Uh, I feel like schools in France tend to be places where kids are free to express their opinions and it has to stay that way. We shouldn't have too prescriptive an approach as to how we teach kids. If we tell them what to think, if we tell them um, what values are right, we do not teach them how to be critical quite exactly. And, and I get the sense that the, 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 the videos you're showing us right now are actually doing a great job at helping kids think for themselves. And I think that's key. And I think we're actually doing a pretty good job at it. And the, edu the education ministry is supporting you. Sure. I mean, we can always do more. There's so much we need to do. Think about it. Uh, people tend to um, criticize the youth for, you know, the, the, the way they spell words, for uh, the way their language is, is, is uh, less sophisticated than it used to be. But it's because young people have so much more to learn. They have to learn how to use a computer. They have to learn how to oppose different viewpoints. It's easier to have... Uh, you know, an understanding of the media when it was restricted. Now it's open to so many, many different things. Now, as teachers, we are asked to, to do a lot. And, and when I have those conversations, I, I tend to say, look, there's only so much schools can do. Uh, it, it's going to take a village. It's going to take more than just what, what the state can do. It's, it, it's going to have to be a more profound change in how people think about how we, we bring up the youth, I think. A decade ago, when social media was still new, there was a New York Times columnist, Thomas Friedman, who marveled at the fact that everyone's a publisher. Do you feel that pressure when you hit send on, a, on, a, on a, an Instagram post? Um, perhaps not the same pressure as a publisher feels because the posts are you know, usually photos of family and friends and myself. Um, but there, there is a certain pressure you know, knowing that other people are going to see this and you, know, you really do have to think about how, what image you are putting of yourself in the world. And I think that's you know, a problem that a lot of people my age think about the image that they want other people to see. Right, the image you want other people to see and the place, you've been talking about Instagram a lot because that's your weapon mm -hmm. of choice. But uh, uh, this year, this pandemic year, uh, if there's one social media that's soared, well, it's TikTok. And uh, just a reminder, this is what TikTok does. Once was a ship that put to sea. The name of the ship was a belly of tea. The winds blew up her bow, up down below my belly boys blow. Soon may the weather man come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. A stirring rendition that's gone viral and prompted a career change for that young Scott, by the way. But as Derek Thompson found out, tales on TikTok aren't always uplifting. Salut, chef. Moi, c'est 
faire ce boulanger au Rijève. Je suis Camerounais. Nous sommes comme ça ici à Libye, en 2022. Nous, on a pris la route avec les frères. Nous sommes arrivés au Niger, à Agadez. On a trouvé un concert. Le nom de Abitare. On a payé tous les noms de 150 000. Nous avons donné 80 000. Nous avons donné 150 000. Now, Derek, that, that, that clip is a little confusing because we're hearing this music while at the same time he's telling that uh, tragic story of uh, effectively being kidnapped uh, on, on what he thought was his journey towards Algeria. Absolutely. There's a lot for people who don't know TikTok to take in there. <laughs> so let me just break it down. That first video you saw, the, the sea shanty, that's a perfect example of, of what TikTok is. TikTok is super fun. It's collaborative. It's creative. It's interactive. And so what you saw there was someone who started out singing a song, then other people added their own lines. And it was all done in perfect harmony. That was a great example of people working together. TikTok also works together uh, in other ways, and people will, will, will find a video, add something to it, add some music to it, and then add, add their own response to it and send that around to friends. And so what you saw in the second one is a bit chaotic. And if for someone who doesn't know it, you hear music playing, you see a kid doing something down at the bottom of the screen, you don't understand. And then you see this African guy talking from the heart, saying he's been kidnapped. You're confused about what's going on. Now, what in fact happens, we suspect that that video of the African man is authentic. We haven't been able to prove it. We're trying to find him but it certainly has the ring of truth. He says that he was kidnapped while trying to get up through the Sahara Desert to, to Europe by people in Libya and is now being held to ransom. It's a heartfelt, emotional plea. And that has been massively shared by kids in France and in the States with the Black Lives Matter hashtag against slavery, against abuse of people like that. Um, and it's a really interesting example because that's a desperately serious message being shared by kids in a serious way because they understand it's important. And kids can read all that code. I was speaking to a 12-year-old about this video and I said, what's going on? It makes it seem like they're trivializing this poor, this poor boy's plight. And in fact, um, this person, this 12-year-old told me they have probably added the music to make this video evade TikTok's censors. There's a perception that TikTok will sometimes take down sensitive videos like this. And so sometimes kids will add the music to make it seem less politically sensitive or less, less sensitive. So kids will actually understand this. But if you don't know TikTok, you don't know what's going on. But I think that TikTok is, uh, there's a lot of very serious, very good content being shared. Maya Lundi, you agree? Yeah, I definitely agree that uh, that TikTok is a very diverse platform. You know, you can find entertainment as much as activism. And then uh, within that whole world of acti activism, there are ways, you know, that people, users use codes and ways to kind of evade the, not the censors, but the, you know, the, to, to work the algorithm so that more people can have access to these videos. Uh, it, it, but in some cases it is to evade censorship. Yes, yes, it is. So what do you think about that? I mean, should it be open to everyone? Because remember, like, same with Instagram. At the beginning they said, this is just going to be for sharing photos of, you know, of, what is it, cats playing the piano and stuff. <laughs> and, but in fact, it's taken on, as you've explained, uh, a more serious tone. Should we be having to, send, to evade the censors to get the message across? No, we shouldn't have. We should, we should be able to share, uh, you know, messages of activism very easily online, but I, I do think that it, it, the platforms such as TikTok do make it very easy to share these kinds of messages across. Uh, it is true that there are sometimes a need to like evade censors and other things like that. Um, but overall, I think it is definitely a very easy way to share things. And, and you can confirm what Derek says about the sophistication of younger people who get it, who get all the codes of how TikTok works. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's true that it might be, I didn't realize that until he mentioned that, that the music and the person at the bottom might be distracting. Uh, but once he pointed it out, I do realize how that might be strange for someone who isn't used to seeing videos built like that. Gabriel Atonzo, your reaction to that? Well, if we're talking about TikTok or Instagram or any other social network, my, my biggest concern is these are designed for pleasure seekers. And that's okay. I like pleasure myself. But the truth is the media you consume through these social medias is ones that you like or dislike. 
Earlier in the debate, François, you said, okay, how do we get younger people to be more nuanced? And this is not a point that I'm making myself at this very moment. It was said in a more eloquent way by, by a social psychologist called Jonathan Haidt. He wrote The, Med uh, the Calling of the uh, American Mind and other great books. And he says, nuance is a superpower for the youth today. And where I go farther than he does is it's not just our responsibility as teachers or associations. Well, what does he mean by, by nuance is a superpower for the youth of the day? He means that our experience online is centered around whether or not we like or dislike. There is no way for us to click on a link and say, I disagree with the person, but I enjoyed being confronted with a viewpoint that is not mine. mine. And that's what media such as yours does. It is great reporting challenges our viewpoints. And the thing is, belief systems are precious to us. And if we lose them, it's like losing a part of ourselves. But that's what great reporters do, right? They change us in some way. Online, I don't think we're looking for ways to change. We, we are looking for bias confirmations. And, and that's my issue with, with uh, TikTok or Instagram, et cetera, and so on, is not only are we exposed to notions that we previously held, we are also not encouraged to think outside of, you know, what the algorithm will think we, we want to see, right? So in a way, there is a responsibility for big tech to act there. They have to rethink their, their product. So it's not just pleasure seeking, but it is well, also- Well, their business model is to keep you online as long yeah. as possible. And it's to do that- It's a casino. To it, make you stay online, they'd yeah. rather have you see people you agree with, right? Yes, yes. And it's, it's easier to, to create a reaction or to get a reaction out of the people watching you when you are controversial than when you are nuanced. That's, that's a real, real problem. Maya, do you ever make the conscious effort to get out of your comfort zone and look at the, the posts of people you don't agree with? Yeah, it's true. I definitely sometimes spend time on people's accounts that I don't necessarily agree with. And it is an interesting experience. Why do you do it? I don't know, to sort of, to see a different point of view and to see what everyone's talking about, really. That's usually why I click on people's accounts. But, you know, once you go through these accounts, uh, it's, you know, sort of surprising to try to imagine thinking in a different way than, than I do. But I definitely agree with what you were saying uh, mm. about how uh, social media is sort of built to please you. And so it is true that a lot of what you see uh, are, is content that you enjoy and that, you, that agrees with your opinions. Derek, uh, I'll put the question to you, too. Do you go out of your comfort zone when uh, you start your day and you're having your morning cup of coffee and you're looking up news sources? Absolutely. I, I try to, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a, you have to go out of your way to go out of your comfort zone because, as you, as you all say, the algorithms are feeding you what you, they think you want to see. I'm sick of what my own friends say. I know what they say, but I've known for years. I want to see what other people have to say. And that, that's a problem. Um, no matter how good the content is, uh, if we're not being fed it, we're not going to see it. And that's going to be a, pro a problem as long as we have prof you know, profit-making uh, networks. And that's the, way, the, the way, that's the way things are. And uh, after visiting the schools you, in, in preparation for this media in, uh, in school week here in France, do you agree with Gabriel that uh, young people are aware that they have that superpower of nuance? I'm concerned that young people aren't quite as smart as they think they are. They're much smarter than, than we think they are, but they're not quite as smart as, as they think they are. I'm, I'm concerned about an erosion of line between fact and fiction. I'm concerned about a, a, an erosion of, of genres, if you like. On TikTok, talk, everything has the same kind of tone, whether it, or not it's serious or, or, or whether it's trivial. And everything is um, what they call in France second degré. Everything is ironic. Everything is is meta. This it's it's, it's memes. It's in jokes. And I'm worried that that is somehow eroding any basic line between fact and fiction, and fact and entertainment. And so I'm worried that kids don't appreciate that. But then at the same time they do. It's I, I, I honestly I'm, I'm in two minds. Kids are, are very smart and they follow things and they go and they go after news and they learn things on these social media that, um, that, that, that come to them before they come to us very often. Yeah, we have a lot to learn. Uh, I want to thank you, Derek Thompson. Many thanks uh, for joining us. Uh, uh, again, you can see that report on our, web, on our France uh, 24 Observers uh, website. I want to thank as well 
Maya Lundi, best best luck with your senior year. And uh, Gabriel uh, Latanzio, best of luck as well. Uh, stay with us. There's much more to come. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.